And uh, hi, everybody, and thank you all for sticking around for this last presentation. So um, today I'd like to take the time and present some results of the latest project that I've been working on as a graduate student. But uh, for starters, let me say a few words on the overall context of uh, this project. Now, the current theory of stellar evolution suggests that uh, stars with mass up to about seven or eight solar mass will end their lives either uh, as a white dwarfs, while stars with mass above 12 solar mass will end up as uh, neutron stars or even black holes. But the evolution of intermediate mass stars uh, poses a very interesting question in the field of stellar astrophysics, since uh, the behavior of such stars during the late stages of their evolutions of the revolution is, is riddled with uncertainties and their final fate is highly de uh, debatable. These stars are known as super AGB stars and have some very interesting properties. And first off, after the core helium burning, the internal structure of uh, super AGB stars looks something like this, where we have an inert carbon oxygen core surrounded by two uh, burning shells. But this configuration leads to periodic thermal pulses, uh, to, to periodic thermonuclear instabilities, let's say, which are known as helium shell flashes, or simply put, thermal pulses. And the impact of those flashes is that they reduce the accretion of material uh, onto the core. And additionally, one of the key points of uh, super AGB stars is the occurrence of the second ray jump. During, um, during this episode, the envelope convection deepens and finally penetrates into the core, reducing its mass, as shown in this, uh, in this plot on the top left corner, where you see the, the mass before and after this mixing episode. So the combination of the secondary job and the occurrence of thermal pulses make it uh, harder for the core to grow and reach the stratosphere mass limit. Now, another important characteristic of uh, these stars is uh, a temperature inversion that causes carbon to ignite off center. This creates a carbon burning front that propagates towards the center and uh, converts the carbon oxygen mixture into an oxygen and neon uh, composition. But uh, an important aspect of this carbon burning is that it produces also some isotopes that can participate in a series of weak reactions called Urca process. And the Urca process under the right conditions can act as a local cooling agent and uh, significantly alter the thermal structure of the core, as you see here on the, on the bottom right. Uh, this is basically a plot uh, that shows the evolution of the core in terms of the central density in the X axis and central temperature on the, on the Y axis. Oops, sorry. Uh, but in any case, as the core is being compressed, it will eventually uh, reach a critical, the density will reach a critical value for electron captures on neon 20 to be initiated. And this rapid removal of electrons from the, the generate electron gas essentially reduces the pressure gradient that holds the whole star together. And um, the core collapses into a neutron star. This is known as an electron capture supernova. However, um, if during, this or, if during this process, the nuclear fuel is ignited, the star could still explode. And whether the final outcome will be an electron-induced implosion or a thermonuclear runaway depends on the rate of the deleptonization of the core versus the nuclear burning rate. But all of that applied to isolated super AGB stars. An interesting twist would, uh, is what would happen if such a star was part of a binary system. And uh, in that case, binary interactions could strip the hydrogen envelope of the super AGB star, and both the secondary job and the thermal pulses can be completely avoided. So in principle, this would allow the core to grow easier and reach the, uh, the centrosecular mass limit solely via a stable uh, shell burning. Now, um, in order to study that, you, you, we used MESA, which as you probably know, is a one-dimensional stellar evolution code to model helium stars, which can be thought as the naked exposed core of super AGB stars in the binary. So like uh, super AGB stars are models ignite carbon off-center, 
creating a carbon burning front, which again propagates towards the center and converts the carbon oxygen core into an oxygen anion. But uh, in all of our models that ignite carbon off center, the carbon flame uh, leaves some traces of unburnt carbon behind, which is caused by convection or other mixing processes that drag ashes from the top of the burning front into its bottom, essentially reducing the efficiency of carbon burning. And uh, this residual carbon that is being distributed within the core is a very important aspect since, as we'll see, this can act as a detonator and uh, change the evolution of the core completely. So in this figure, you can see the evolution of the core for several of our models, again, in terms of central density and central temperature. And uh, I know it, can, it looks a bit messy, but for the moment, let's focus on the, on the blue dashed curve. And this is in principle, the evolution of the, of the core of a typical super AGB star, where it reaches the threshold density for electron captures on neon 20, and from there will either collapse into a neutron star or explode in a thermonuclear supernova. The solid blue line uh, is essentially the same star, but now the core has some leftover carbon in it. And you see that the evolution of, uh, of up to the, the, the work cooling process is pretty much identical for the two models. However, when the density reaches another critical value, which is um, the density for electron captures on magnesium 24 this time uh, to occur, things are starting to take a different turn. The energy released from this weak reaction uh, is enough to ignite the residual carbon, which in turn will ignite oxygen explosively and create a thermal runaway at much lower densities compared to the model that features no residual carbon. And this, the ignition density is important because it can affect the whole explosion dynamics. Um, interestingly, we were, uh, the propagation of the carbon flame that is responsible for the conversion of the carbon oxygen core into oxygen and neon is sensitive to several physical mechanisms that can under the right they, they can under the right circumstances lead to the complete uh, quenching of the flame before it reaches the center and this process creates a hybrid structure where the original inner core is composed of carbon and oxygen and at the same time is surrounded by a layer of oxygen and neon that has been processed by the carbon flame and we were able to evolve a couple of such hybrid cores, an example of which is shown here with the magenta line. And as you see, in contrast to the oxygen neon cores, this hybrid core ignites carbon due to compressional heating in a process that closely resembles a typical supernova 1A progenitor. Now, these diagrams show the final fates of our models as a function of initial mass and initial metallicity. And by constructing a grid of more than 350 models, we were able to constrain the initial mass of, um, of these helium stars that develop oxygen neon cores that can, in principle, grow to the standard second limit and experience a thermonuclear runaway at low densities. And depending on the adopted parameters, such as the initial metallicity, the the overshoot mixing and uh, the wind efficiency, we found that this mass range is between 1.8 to 2.7 solar mass for models without overshooting and it's around 1.6 to 2.5 solar mass for models with overshoot mixing across all convective boundaries. Now, helium stars with uh, mass lower than this uh, range will end up either as a carbon oxygen or a hybrid carbon oxygen neon white dwarfs, while more massive stars will um, grow to more advanced burning stages, they will form a silicon core and they will, eventually they will experience uh, an iron core collapse. So we have established so far that these cores in the Hust regions can go through a thermonuclear runaway event, but uh, the question now is if the energy release is enough to unbind the star. And the answer is yes. If we assume that the nuclear burning will convert the available, the available fuel to around 0.7 solar mass to nickel 56, and the rest 0.6 solar mass to other silicon group elements, which is the typical composition of supernova 1A, 
then the energy released from this burning turns out to be uh, sufficient to unbind the whole star and produce a jetta with kinetic energy that is the same order of magnitude as expected from a typical supernova 1A. But as you probably know, supernova 1A come in different flavors in terms of the spectra and light curves. So it would be nice to know if this progenitor channel can give a distinct nucleosynthetic signature in order to allow us to distinguish it from uh, the other progenitor channels. And the plot right here shows the density profiles for two of our models at uh, two different evolutionary stages. The solid lines represent the density profile when the core has reached its maximum uh, density, and the dashed lines represent the density profile at the end of uh, simulations. So what we get is that if a transition between deflagration to detonation occurs around at uh, the maximum density, then the explosion would produce mostly stable iron group elements and only about 0.3 solar mass of nickel, which would lead to a subluminous explosion. If, on the other hand, uh, the core is allowed to, to, uh, to expand prior to the, the explosion, then the detonation wave that travels through the pre-expanded material would produce only moderate amounts of uh, of iron group elements and uh, up to one solar mass of, uh, of nickel 56, assuming, but it will not expand any further. So to sum things up, uh, we showed that um, helium cores in a specific mass range can create either hybrid or oxygen neon objects that reach the Chandra Chekhar mass without the need of accretion from a dominant star in a binary. And this course can initiate oxygen burning at low densities due to some leftover carbon in their course after they have lost their entire helium envelope. This most likely leads to the complete disruption of the star, avoiding an electron capture supernova and producing ejecta with kinetic energies similar to typical supernova 1A. And uh, generally speaking, since these oxygen ion cores are generally more compact objects than uh, the carbon oxygen progenitors, supernova 1a that we all know and love, this could lead to the overproduction of iron group elements, giving this channel uh, a distinct nucleosynthetic signature. And finally, um, depending on the transition time between the deflagration and detonation, we can expect anything from a subluminous uh, type 1a x supernova to a more typical supernova 1a. So uh, I'll stop here by just saying a few more words very quickly on things that we want to do in the future. Uh, from an observational aspect, since such helium stars are commonly produced in binaries with a neutron star, it would be interesting to have targeted surveys to look for pulsars at supernova 1A remnants, the existence of which would uh, be a strong indicator for the existence of this channel. Uh, however, there is also theoretical work that can be done. It would be nice to have follow-up research with 3D hydrodynamical simulations to accurately map the expected nucleosynthesis and uh, the explosion energies from uh, such systems. Moreover, binary, true binary evolution of the progenitors to such helium stars would help us constrain the, the mass loss history of the system. And finally, there are, at the end of the day, several parameters that could influence the evolution such as rotation, for example, that might be worth to, to investigate into today. So thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. I, so are there any questions? I guess, Joanna, the, the hand has, is from the previous talk, huh? the <coughs> right hand. Yes, to be honest, we are uh, a bit okay. in the uh, So are there any questions? From Manos Zapatas, I think, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's it's a quick uh, general question. So uh, we talked with Savas uh, before, but I want to just mention it again, uh, looking at this nice talk, that it would be very interesting to look at it from the rage point of view of how many of them do you, you would expect it theoretically. Um, and... Uh, so how many of them do you expect to explode like this? And how many of neutron stars that we think we are making right now, you would expect them not to be created? And um, 
pretty much right now we would uh, assume that all of them will not do a thermonuclear explosion, but we they would go to an electro capture making a, a neutron star. Uh, yeah, not as sorry, not a specific question, but uh, it would be interesting to look at it from a rate point of view, or maybe if you if you already have some. Uh, I think there are some estimates already from a rate point of view, right? Uh, right, right. Uh, the thing is, I still need to do some research when it comes to the rates, so I don't feel very com don't feel very comfortable uh, commenting on this uh, on this aspect. But um, what I can say is that all of our simulations show that these helium cores. Uh, have some residual carbon in the course. So we would expect that all stars in the 7 to 11, uh, zero age main sequence stars to 7 to 11 uh, solar mass range, which is the mass range for, from which these helium stars are uh, come from. Uh, we would expect all, all these stars to explode in a, in a thermonuclear supernova and avoid the electron captures. But of course, since um, uh, since this uh, system is originated in a binary, binary directions at different evolutionary stages could affect this mass range and uh, move in or out stars uh, from this specific range that we wouldn't expect something to happen. I don't know if that's uh, relevant on a second thought, but yeah, I just want to put it out there. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Any other questions? Ah, uh, Alexandra, you have a question? Yes, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's very, thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. And uh, let's hope that we will get rid of this uh, mass transfer process that creates a lot of problems in the case of type 1A. Uh, I want just to add an extra uh, component in Manos uh, question, apart from the rates, about the delay time distribution that uh, type 1A follow. Do you have a very rough, at least, estimation if we are talking this would uh, end up as the prompt type 1A or the very delayed type 1A? Uh, do you have any expectations? <clears throat> so uh, the delay time distribution from this channel would be dominated from the main sequence lifetime of the jumps progenitors to those helium stats, which, as I said, lies between 7 to 11 uh, solar mass. So the main sequence lifetime for this mass range is about 30 to 80 million years, maybe. And if that's true, and this thermonuclear explosion can indeed occur, this uh, channel would contribute to the very early delay time distribution. But as I said before, binary interactions can always prolong this uh, uh, lifetime into to several hundred uh, million uh, years. So the bottom line is that this channel, if indeed exists, it could contribute to very early to early uh, delay time distribution, maybe filling in some holes in the single degenerate scenario. Yeah, yeah thank you. You're